Hello and welcome to another week of ECE 108. This week we have our midterm on Friday, so we're only going to have two lectures this week, so do keep that in mind. And the lectures will be a little bit less dense than usual to account for the midterm. So congratulations, we're now on to the second half of the course, and the second half is a little bit different than the first half of the course. Explicitly, it's a little bit less theoretical and more compute this number or compute the probability that something occurs. So keeping this in mind, when working on the assignments now, you should not share the final answer because oftentimes the final answer will be a single number, but you can talk about the general principles that you would apply for any particular problem. So staying policy 71 compliant might be a little bit more complex here. And if you are ever in doubt whether or not you can talk about a particular thing with your fellow peers, either ask during office hours or post a question on Piazza, and we can redefine the new rules for working together there. Next, again, since the final answer for many of the problems will be a single number or maybe an expression, you should make sure that you justify how you get to that final answer. So in general, just writing down the correct final answer, so the correct number, but not showing any work won't, will not give you full credit, and the amount of partial credit you get for just giving the final answer will depend on the problem at hand. So do make sure to very carefully show your work slash explain how you got to the conclusion for that problem. So I'll elaborate on this a little bit more as I go through the examples, but just kind of a forewarning, keep that in the back of your mind Okay, so let's get into today's lecture. Uh, for today's lecture, we're going to introduce some kind of basic fundamental ideas uh, that I'll present as theorems. We're not going to prove them. And then we're going to look at kind of the four classical examples of combinatorics problems that we'll examine throughout the rest of this term. Okay, so combinatorics. We're now going to introduce the basic idea of counting the number of ways that you can pick items from, from some sets. Now this kind of tentative way of introducing combinatorics doesn't cover everything because sometimes we'll want to pick, say, the same item from the set and sets don't have repeated elements. So later on we're going to introduce the idea of multi-sets to kind of fill this out. But tentatively, this is what the idea of combinatorics is. So let's introduce a theorem. The number of ways that we can pick a single element from two different sets, A and B, with the cardinality of A being N and the cardinality of B being M, is simply going to be equal to M times N. So I'm not going to prove this theorem. It should be fairly obvious why this would be true. If you wanted to list out all the possible ways that you can pick a single element from these two sets, we can build a table with A and B being the columns and rows, and we can fill out that table, and that table will have exactly n times n elements. So that's the basic idea here. Next, we can generalize this counting theorem to hold for an arbitrary finite number of sets. So the number of ways that we can pick a single element from n finite sets, a1 through an, is going to simply be the product of the cardinalities of those sets. So here, again, I'm assuming that these sets have finite cardinality. If one of them was a non-finite set, then there'd be an infinite number of ways to pick these things. So here, when you see this second theorem, you should be thinking, hey, this is just a generalization of the first theorem, and I could prove it by doing induction. So essentially, that's what you can do, but we're not going to prove it here. Now, before we go on to look at a few examples, I want to mention that in your proofs or in your work, you do not have to reference these as counting theorems one and counting theorems through two. You can just take these as a given. Okay, so now let's look at several examples to give you a taste of the different combinatorics problems that we're going to handle. And then in the next few lectures, we will formalize these techniques that we used in these various examples. So kind of think of these examples as defining examples for various types of problems we will consider. Okay, so for example one, ordered with replacements. So for this example, suppose we are playing a dice game that involves rolling a d6, so a dice with six sides numbered one through six, standard dice you see in most games, uh, four times and then forming a four digit number. So how do we form this four digit number in this game? Well, the nth digit of your number is going to be the nth number you rolled. 
So if I roll a six to start with, the first number is a six. If I then roll a two, then my second number is a two, etc. So I could ask a question, how many four digit numbers are possible in this game? So this might not be a particularly interesting game on its own, but it's a good example to kind of introduce these types of combinatorics problems. So let's look at the solution to this example. Here, the order of dice rolls matters. If I roll a six and a one, that's different than if I roll a one and a six. So explicitly, our number at the end of the game is going to be roll one, roll two, roll three, roll four. Uh, in that order. So here this roll one is the number that is representing the number that I rolled and these uh, four little underlined slots are saying that I have four slots where I can put a number in. So I'm going to use this type of structure when dealing with these types of problems throughout the rest of this course. So if you have any questions on what I mean by this notation, feel free to ask during piazza or office hours. Okay, so now each roll picks an element from the set one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So roll one picks an element from the set, then roll two picks an element from the same set. Thus, there's going to be six times six times six times six equals six to the fourth equals 1,296 possible numbers in our game. So here I'm technically applying count, counting principle or counting theorem two, uh, but we don't need to formally say that here. So why is this an ordered with replacement type problem? Well, one, the orders of the rolls matter since if I roll a six and a one versus a one and a six, I end up with a different four digit number. And two, the possible dice rolls are the same for each roll. The result of any of my rolls does not affect the result of any of my other rolls. So this is the first and the easiest type of combinatorics problem that we're going to discuss ordered with replacement. Let's look at another example, ordered without replacement. So before we get into the details of this example, what do we think the difference is going to be? Well, over here, I was, quote, replacing the po number of possibilities because I rolled the same dice each time. So if I'm doing something without replacement, in some sense, it's like if I roll a, if I roll a six on the first roll, I can no longer roll a six on any subsequent rolls. So yeah, to make that a little bit more concrete, let's look at this example. Bianca and her 12 cats like to play a game. In this game, Bianca picks four different cats at random and gives each one of those cats a treat. After eating their treats, the cats then form a line in the order that they finish their treats. So an important part for this game is that no two cats finish the treats at the exact same time. What are the total number of ways the cats can be lined up at the end of this game? Okay, so how would we go about solving this problem? Well, here in this case, the order of the cats matters, right? Like if one cat finishes first and then the second cat finishes, that's a different result than if they finish in different orders. So this is kind of similar to the number problem we had on the previous slide where if I get a six and a one, that's different than getting a one and a six. So yeah, order still matters and the cats are unique. Each cat is a unique special little kitty, so the cats are unique. Uh, thus, each time we pick a cat, we have one less cat to choose from to fill the next place in line, right? So our line of cats looks something like this, where we have cat one, cat two, cat three, cat four. And once we have a cat one, there's only 11 cats left to pick from. So here there's 12 op options for cat one, 11 options for cat two, 10 options for cat three, nine options for cat four, and then we're done with the game so we don't have to continue. So now how could we compute the total number of ways that the cats can be lined up in this case? Well, I'm filling each one of these slots with a different set. The first set has cardinality 12, second has cardinality 11, etc. So the number of ways that I can pick an element from each one of these sets is going to be 12 times 11 times 10 times nine. So here I'm invoking the second theorem that I had on the very first slide, where the cardinality of each one of these sets is 12, 11, 10, nine respectively. So here, if I multiply these together, there's 11,880 possible outcomes of this game. So if Bianca and her cats decided to play this game twice a day, it would take 16.27 years to go through all of the possible outcomes of the game. Okay, so this is the second type of 
problem that we're going to consider in this course, and it's the second easiest type of combinatoric problem that we will cover. So let's look at the next problem. So in this problem, we're going to consider a unordered without replacement type of combinatorics problem. So what do we think the main difference here will be? Well, it's going to be the case where order doesn't matter. So if I were to roll a six and a one versus a one and a six, that would be the same thing. And without replacement means that once I pick an element, I can no longer pick that element for the next round. So let's look at this problem. Consider another game where I pick colored treats out of a box of three treats. Each of these treats has a different color. What are the total number of color combinations when I take two treats out of the box? So here, I don't have this replacement going on because every time I take a treat out, I don't put another treat back in. And it's unordered since I don't care what the order of the treats is. I only care about what the color combination at the end is. So order doesn't matter, and yeah. Okay, so how would I try to tackle this? Well, the typical way that you tackle this is you first ask, how many ways can you pull, in this case, two treats out of the box of three treats? And then I ask, how many rearrangements are there of those two treats? And I divide out by the rearrangements. So let's kind of get into the details here. How many ways can I pull two treats out of the box? Well. For the first treat, there's three different ways that I can pick a treat. And for the second treat, there's only two ways that I can pick it because I don't replace the treat after I pull the first one out. So in total, there's three times two equals six ways. So this is essentially doing the ordered without replacement problem that I did before. So now that I have my two treats, we have a problem. This way of counting the possible ways that I can pick the treats here does not differentiate between picking a blue treat and then a red treat versus getting a red treat and then a blue treat. So explicitly this counts red blue differently than blue red, but these are the same color combinations. So I thus need to find a way to count the number of ways that I can reorder the treats and remove those uh, possibilities that we double counted. So how can I do this? Well, I can notice there's only two treats, right? So it's either treat one, treat two, or treat two, treat one. So there's only two possible uh, orders in which I can draw uh, two treats. So from here, I get that I must divide the results by two. So to be a bit more explicit here, for every two possibilities that I had in this way of counting, there's only one unique color combination. So that's why I divide by two. I'll elaborate on that in a little bit too. So from here, thus the number of total combinations is going to be six divided by two, which is just equal to three. So again, why do we divide? Uh, for some of you, this might be obvious and it might just come naturally to you, but let's draw this particular problem out to get a deeper understanding for why I have to divide by the number of rearrangements. Well, again, why do we divide? Let's look at the possibilities. So here, if my colors were red, blue, and orange, uh, these are the total possibilities of ways that I can pick two treats. So just by brute force, you can arrive at this. So here you can note that these are split into two categories, right? There's two groups of the same color combinations. There's this one here uh, by these three elements here, and then there's this group here with these three elements. So in this case, there's six possible ways to pick two treats out of the box, but I only care about half of those. So in general, when I'm working on these uh, unordered without replacement problems, I will first compute the number of ways that I can do the problem without considering the order. And then I'll note that if I want to find what the unordered possibilities are, all I have to do is to divide by the possible rearrangements. So this trick here kind of works in general and we'll formalize this in the coming lectures. Okay, so now let's look at a similar problem that's a bit more complex. So again, unordered without replacement. So I have another game where I picked colored treats out of a box. There are six treats, each with a different color. What are the total number of combinations when I take three treats out of the box? So the difference is I changed my three treats to a six and I changed my two treats to a three. Okay, so how would I do this? Well, 
Again, there's going to be 6 times 5 times 4, which is 120, ways of picking two different colored treats out of this box. So this is the same counting argument that I did previously. Uh, there are six ways to pick the first treat, and then when I go to pick the second, there's only five left. So I can apply that theorem too if I want to be a bit more formal. So now I need to know how many reorderings are there. So to be a bit more explicit, in this method here where I counted, I double counted, well, multi-counted possible color combinations by pulling out treats in different orders. So red, blue, green versus blue, red, green. So how many ways are there to reorder three distinct objects? Well, if we let RGB denote the colors that I picked, what are the rearrangements? Well, I can brute force this if I wanted. So I have RGB, and then I could leave R up front and swap the order of GB. And that's all of the possibilities that I start with by pulling a red one. So next, what if I started by pulling a green? Well, I could do green, red, blue, or I could do green, blue, red. Again, that's all of the possible arrangements that I can pick three different colored treats by starting with a green treat. So finally, I could start with a blue treat. So here I could have blue, green, red, and then I could build the other one by swapping green and red, and I get this. So from here, there's exactly six possible rearrangements of the colors of the treats that I pull out of the box. We'll give a much better systematic way of computing these later on, but that's how I do it for now. So here if I wanted to compute the total number of color combinations, I would take my 120 and I would divide it by six. So explicitly, the total number of color combinations is going to be 120 over six, which is just 20. So here, if I wanted to kind of think of an analog to this list that I had here, my analog would be having a list that looked like this, and I'm going to have 20 of these different lists where I would replace, say, red with one of my different colors, orange, for instance. So from this example, you can clearly see how very quickly these problems can be pretty atrocious to work out all of the possible combinations by hand. So in this case, I could do that, I wouldn't want to, but conceivably it doesn't take too long to write out all 120 possible ways of pulling these three colors out and then noting that, hey, I can split them into 20 lists that look like this and therefore there's exactly 20 different combinations here. That said, the probability of making an error doing that is very, very high. So this is just begging for some nice general principles for that we can apply to these type of problems to tackle them. And that's what we're going to do in our next few lectures. So now, so far I've considered ordered with replacement, ordered without replacement, unordered without replacement. Uh, is there anything that might be left to try to consider there? Well, unordered with replacement. So this is by far the hardest type of combinatorics problem that I can give you out of these kind of four basic problems. So let's jump into an example which will take basically the rest of this lecture. Okay, so when starting a new D&D campaign with three of your friends, there's 12 classes that each one of you can choose from. So a natural question I can ask is how many parties can be formed between you and all of your friends? So here, there's the name of the classes in the base game, if you're interested. So let's now look at the solution for this. So there's going to be four people that need to pick a class, right? You and then all of your friends. And we want to know the number of ways that these players can pick their classes. So let's kind of draw out one of these little diagrams like I had before. Well, here, each one of the friends will pick some class and these classes one through four can be any of these 12 classes. And I wanna know the number of party compositions that I can form. So I don't care what friend plays which class, I just wanna know what are the possible class compositions that can exist. So for dealing with any of these combinatorics problems, kind of drawing something like this out to get an idea of what the problem is asking, is a very, very good first step because if you don't kind of internalize what the problem is even asking, you don't have much of a chance of actually answering the question. So just keep that in mind when you do your homework. So to do this, I'm going to consider five cases. 
So a priori, I wouldn't know that, yes, I should consider five cases. Uh, I would just kind of go through the different cases to see how many cases I have. And then I would at the end say, hey, I consider five cases. So just keep that in mind as well, that when I went to solve this problem, I didn't know how many cases to consider at the beginning. So why do I want to use cases? Well, this problem as it stands is kind of complex. There's lots of moving parts. So it's a good idea to turn this problem into simpler little cases and then just add up the pos number of possibilities between each one of those cases. So we'll formalize this process in the next lecture, but that's what we're doing. So here, the first case is where everyone picks the same class. So in this case, I'm going to put a big box here and note that all of the friends pick the same class. Okay, so if everyone picks the same class, how many ways can I do that? So just take a minute and try to think that through. Well, we know that there's 12 ways to pick a single class, right? So since there's 12 ways to determine what this class one will be, there's going to be exactly 12 possibilities of ways upon which all of the players can pick the same class. Okay, so now for the next case, I'm going to consider a case where not everyone picks the same class. So in particular, I'm just going to say, hey, what if friend four picked a different class? So in this case, three players pick one class and the last player picks a different class. So what would this look like? Well, this would be friend one, two, three, picking all class one, and friend four picking class two. So here I need to be careful to determine whether or not I need to distinguish between class one and class two. So to be explicit there, if I pick class one to be say a monk and class two to be say a wizard, that's different than if class one was a wizard and class two was a monk. The party compositions there are different. So in this case, I do need to distinguish which class doubles up, i.e. swapping the order of class one and class two changes the party composition. So here, after I do my kind of counting argument to pick the number of ways that I can pick class one and class two, I don't need to divide by anything since I want to distinguish between which class goes where. Okay, so how many possible ways can I pick class one and then pick class two? Well, now class one has to be different from class two, otherwise I'm in the case that I've considered over here. So since they have to be two different things, then there's going to be 12 ways that I can pick the boxed class, so class one, and there's going to be 11 ways that I can pick the remaining class. So if I combine these together, there's going to be 11 times 12, or 132 possible party compositions under this setup. Okay, so now I've considered two cases, one where every class is the same and one where three people pick the same class and one per person picks a different class. Let's look at the next case. Well, the next natural case to build is what if two players pick one class and the other two players pick another class? So from here, I'd have friend one, friend two, both pick class one, and I would have friend three and friend four picking class two. So now, in this case, notice that if I do swap class one and class two, I end up with the same party composition. So in this case, I do not distinguish which class doubles up since swapping the order does not change what the party composition is. So in this case, after I compute the number of ways that I can pick class one and class two, I'll have to divide by the number of ways that I can rearrange these two boxes. So let's look at this. So how many ways can I pick class one? Well, there's 12 ways. How many ways can I pick class two? Well, class two has to be different than class one. So there's now 11 ways left. So now what are the number of ways that I can swap these two boxes? Well, I could just leave it as it is now, or I could make class one class two and class two equal to class one. Therefore, there's exactly two ways that I can swap the grouping. So from here, there's going to be 12 times 11, so the number of ways of picking class one and class two, divided by the number of ways that I can swap the grouping, two equals 66 parties in this case. Okay, so now we have two more cases to go at. 
I've considered the case where everyone picked the same class. I've considered the case where I had three pick one class and one pick another class. And the case where two people picked one class and two people clicked another class. Well, the next option that I can look at is two players pick one class and the other two players pick two different classes. So what would this look like? Well, I'd have this box here where I picked class one, the box here where I picked class two, and this box here where I picked class three. So now, before I look at the number of possibilities that I could pick for class one, class two, class three, let's think about possible rearrangements of these boxes that could matter. Well, it doesn't matter which friend picks class two and which friend picks class three, because if I swap these, I have the same party composition. But if I change class one with either of these two classes, I end up with a different party composition. So from here, uh, I do need to distinguish which class has two players, but I don't need to distinguish which class has a single player. So keeping that in mind, there's again 12 ways to pick class one, there's 11 ways to pick class two, and there are 10 ways to pick class three, because there's 10 remaining at that point. So now how many ways can I swap the order of class two and class three? Well, we did this problem before and we found that there are two possible ways to reorder two items. Therefore, there's two ways we can swap these classes. So combining these together, I have 12 times 11 times 10, all divided by two ways that I could possibly have two players pick one class and the other two players pick a different class. So numerically, there are 660 parties in this case. So now on to our last case. All players pick a different class. So this would look like this, where each friend picks a different class. Here I didn't box them in. So let's rectify this situation. So now in this case, you can notice that the order of these classes doesn't matter. Uh, friend one could play class one and friend two could play class two, or friend one could play class two and friend two could play class one. Those result in the same ultimate party composition. So here we do not distinguish between which classes are played by which friend. So now, how many ways can I pick class one, two, three, and four? Well, there's 12 ways to pick class one. Then there's going to be 11 remaining ways to pick class two. There's going to be 10 ways remaining to pick class three. And there's going to be nine ways remaining to pick class four. So now I only need to know the number of ways that I can swap these class orders around, i.e. swap the order of which friend plays which class. So I could try to do this via the argument that I did previously where I wrote out all the possibilities, but that's going to start becoming tedious really fast. So let's think of a combinatorics way of doing this. So if I had four classes that were going to be played, how many ways could friend one pick a class? Well, friend one would have four options. And then after friend one picked, friend two would then only have three options, right? Whatever the three remaining classes are. So there'd be three ways to pick who chooses the second class. Next, friend three would then only have two options. And friend four, well, they have one option. So if I put all of this together, there's four times three times two times one ways that each friend could pick between these four classes without replacement. Okay, so, so putting all of this together, I have that there's 12 times 11 times 10 times nine ways to pick the classes divided by this many ways of rearranging the friends. So if I do some algebra here, this is simply 945 parties for this case. So now notice between these five cases, A through E, I've covered all of the possible ways that I could build these parties. So to be a bit explicit, these five cases here cover all of the possible ways that I could select a party of four characters. So now if I add up the number of ways that I can build parties of these five forms, that will give me the total number of party compositions. So adding all of these up, I get 12 plus this plus that plus that plus that, or 1,365 ways to pick a party of four charters. There we go, we rectified that error. Uh, so that was kind of hard. There were a lot of little cases to do. Is there a better way? Well, 
sometimes. So sometimes you will have to resort to doing an argument kind of like this if there's no general principle that you can build for that problem. So in some counting problems, you will have to do these type of long-winded, lots of little case arguments, and it's very easy to miss a case or double count a case. But in other situations, in particular for this situation, there is a general principle that you can apply to this problem and boom, the problem's done. So explicitly, you can note that 12, the number of classes, plus four, the number of classes I was picking, minus one, that thing factorial, which I haven't defined yet, but you should know what it is. If you don't, we define it next uh, lecture, divided by four factorial. So again, four was the number of players times 12 minus one factorial. And again, 12 was the number of classes is also equal to 1,365. Is this an accident? Well, no. And we'll talk about that within the next few weeks. Uh, in particular, this one we should talk about on July 5th, so it'll be a couple weeks from now. So now we've seen several motivating problems for different types of or classes of combinatorics problems. In the next few lectures, we're going to introduce some tools that will allow you to tackle these problems without necessarily invoking these longer arguments. Sometimes you'll have to, but just take these examples as motivation for the next five lectures from now, not including this lecture. Okay, so assigned reading, read pages 65 through 68. So explicitly, there are examples one through four uh, on page 65 and 66, and going into page 67 of it, read those examples as they provide different examples of each one of these classes of examples that I provided here here. So definitely go through those as a little bit of extra practice and to see more problems worked out. Uh, in my experience when doing things with combinatorics, the kind of most important thing is seeing examples to really get a grasp over how to do these arguments. Uh, yeah, they have some general forms to them and there's some general principles you can use, but to build up intuition, you really need to practice. So practice makes perfect. Definitely go through those, those examples. Oversold it a little bit, but oh well. And now we have a meme. Our monster's good at math. Not unless you count Dracula. Uh, so yeah, I will see you next lecture and have a good day.